saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus has fled? Fear not, he is with us, so be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand. Upheld by his merciful almighty In this session, we're going to talk about just the church in the New Testament, lest you think the church is not emphasized in the New Testament. We all know that it is, don't we? So, so here we go. So the book of Acts, it's about the beginning and the growth of the church, right? And, and you, you see that. It, you know, on Sunday morning, I'm going to talk about the Great Commission and the life of the church. You know, after the Lord gave the Great Commission, you see the Great Commission fulfilled in the book of Acts. But I think a lot of churches don't understand what the Great Commission is. I, I mean, I know it's simple. I get that. But you guys, I think sometimes we stop way short. But the, the book of Acts is all about the beginning of the church and the importance of the church and being devoted to the church. 
When you go to Romans, you know, it's about the, the saints and it's helping us to understand the doctrine and practice in the life of the church. You know, even getting into how do we function together in the church? How do our gifts work together, etc. First and second Corinthians are a reminder that church is going to have problems. They were not easy places. You know, it seems to me like Paul would go, you know what? Maybe I'm going to like cut the letters from there and just go other places. But he had a passion for that church, even though that church had lots of, lots of challenges. And God accomplished a work in that church. It wasn't an easy work. Galatians is to the churches of Galatia. And Ephesians talks about equipping the saints for the work of the service, for the building up the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is the church. Philippians, you know, it talks about uh, to the saints in Christ Jesus or in Philippi, including the overseas and deacons, the leaders of the church. It just goes on and on. Uh, you know, Colossians, again, to the saints and First, Second Thessalonians, it's the beginning of this church that is, is, it grows in extremely difficult circumstances. And yet it's a faithful church, so faithful that they're commended that other churches are looking at them and following their example. First, second, Timothy, Titus, what are they? They're letters to leaders in the church, how the church must function. Philemon, when there's issues related to a Christian in the church, it's instructions on how to deal with that. Hebrews talks about considering how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together. James, even at the end, talks about call the elders of the church together to pray. First Peter gives instructions in the church in chapter 5, instructions specifically to elders in the church. Second Peter, dangers in the church. First John, what it looks like when we walk in the light, knowing that there's some people that are going to be part of the church, but they're not really part of the church, and they're going to leave the church. Which is a reminder, you don't want everybody to stay in the church. Okay? Because if there are people in the church that are not in Christ and have no interest in being in Christ, that's a problem. I mean, that's a problem. Don't get me wrong. We want to reach the unsaved and we want to minister to the unsaved. But today, we have what's called the church for the unchurched. Uh, those don't go together. The church is for the saints to reach the unsaved, Right? Second, third John, they're just talking about how the church needs to respond to certain people in different contexts. Jude is a warning against false teachers in the church. Revelation has seven letters to who? Did you notice there's not letter number eight to the unchurched Christians? Not there. And you guys, these churches, there, there's some blessings and there's some challenges in them. But it was written to the churches, not to Christians disassociated from the church. That's not there. I think it's important that we keep that in mind. The church is described in a number of different ways. And if you happen to be going through becoming a biblical leader, which is a discipleship manual, I've really pulled a lot of this from that manual that we use. But I want to talk about how the church is described because I think it's helpful. And I want to begin by talking about the church as the body of Christ. Okay, now you're going to have to think with me on this. The church as the body of Christ. To, to really begin to comprehend what does that mean as the church if we are the body of Christ? We already talked about him being the head, right? In, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you have Christ, who's the head, and then all of those who are his children are a part of this body that are under the authority of the head. So the head is dictating to the body how it functions to be the church. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, it says, And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So, so understand that one of the objectives in the church is that God entrusts specific people to be leaders in the church, and their role is not to do all the work of the church. 
their responsibility is actually to equip the saints, that's every believer in the church, for the work of service in the church. Right? So that means in a healthy, God-honoring church, every single Christian is engaged. Either as leaders equipping the saints or as saints being equipped all for the sake of the work of service. So there's nobody passive. Okay? Nobody on the sidelines. It goes on and it says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. In other words, you got to understand that, that the, the church is not just for the sake of getting people saved and now we're going to ha heaven, happy, happy, happy. The idea of the church is God saves people so that they become a part of this body, all learning to serve and work together for a common purpose with the ultimate of goal that every single one of us would become mature in Christ, mature in our knowledge of God's word. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. You, you, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But in evangelical churches today, I would suggest to you, this is a training church, this is a unique church, okay? I would suggest to you that most men who serve as in elders in evangelical churches in America, and I'm speaking specific of lay elders, most could not defend their own doctrinal statement. I'm not saying they're not godly men. I'm not saying they're not faithful men. I'm not saying they can't affirm a doctrinal statement. I am saying that I think most could not, Bible in hand, if you ask them about a cardinal doctrine like the Trinity, say, can you defend it? I think most could not. I'm not saying they can't affirm it. But you guys, elders are required to be able to protect sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. But let me say also, most Christians don't have the opportunity to be trained in those things in the church. You are in a unique situation. You are, you are in an extremely unique situation. I'll probably say this again Sunday morning. And I've known Chris most of his life and a greater share of mine. And you guys, as a church that trains their elders, trains their men, trains their women trains men to be pastors, men and women to be missionaries. You know how few churches do that? Unbelievably few. You guys, part of the church is we grow in maturity. It's not that we're now we're a Christian, we're just happy. It's no, I need to grow in my understanding. I need to grow in my knowledge. I need to know God's word so that I can share. I think a lot of people don't evangelize because they couldn't defend their own faith. But as we grow in those things, we become more mature and we, we accomplish the work that God intends as the church. It's a beautiful thing. And it says, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part. You, you hearing this? The whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of every individual part, it causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So he's talking about how God has ordained this so that we all fit together as believers in a very specific way ordained by the creator of the universe to accomplish exactly what God intends us to accomplish. Now, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 when it talks about the body of Christ. And if you ever, maybe you're a young person here today, and you're in trouble, and your dad's going to lecture you, and, and it's like, okay, okay, I got it. You know, but the dad just keeps going, keeps going. And you're like, I got it. Okay, I got it. But he just keeps going. 
That's what Paul does. And it's not a hard concept, but obviously we struggle to get it. Okay? And you'll see this. So in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12, he explains, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Okay, so he's just doing a little math here. Essentially saying, okay, Christ is the head, one body. The body is comprised of what? Many members. Like, you know, fingers, toes, and you know, you got, there's all kinds of parts to the body. Okay? But then he goes on, lest we should misunderstand. And, you know, have you ever heard somebody say, you know, the church doesn't need me? <laughs> you know, I think it's kind of funny. So when I was in Texas, I worked in a pretty big church. I'm in Cotopaxi, Texas, or Colorado now. Cotopaxi, try to find it. Well, internet will help you. Map, harder. Little tiny mountain community where I'm involved in the church. And uh, it's 50 in the summer, maybe 70 people. It's a mountain community. Sweet church. When I was in the big church, there would be people say, you know, there's so many people here, they don't need me. Then you're in a small church, and they say, well, there's not that many people, they don't need me. The point is that God says you are a part of the body. This has nothing to do with the size of the church. You are a part of this body designed by God to accomplish a purpose in this body. It's not, is it big or small or opportunities? It's this is what God has done. So, for those who say God does not need me or the church does not need me, in verse 15 it says, If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And you guys, when you think about this, it's, you know, there is an absurdity to it, right? You know, because you can't get your, your hand and your foot talking to each other. But he's talking about how absurd it is for us as Christians to, to explain to God why in his eternal plan he, he misunderstood my role. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? God intentionally, if you're a Christian, God intentionally determines your precise role in the body. In verse 18, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. If you're a Christian, God has placed you in the body, in the precise place, with the precise gifting to accomplish exactly what he wants through your life. Now, a variety of gifts are essential for the body to function properly. So verse 19 says, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one Body, So there's going to be diversity within the body, so the body functions appropriately. And then you have those who would say, yeah, but I don't really need other Christians to live out the Christian life. And so he says in verse 21, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You are not the judge. God says, if you're a Christian, I have equipped you to serve in the body of Christ in a precise way. You can't say, they don't need me. You're not a good judge of what you need. 
Verse 22, on the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God, listen, has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked. In other words, God designs it intentionally for it to work well. And we're not the judges of, of how my role fits. We, we are just a part of fulfilling God's purposes. And then he emphasizes the importance of unity and love in verse 25 and 26 when he says, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, so, so here's the thing that you have to keep and remember. It's got, you remind yourself is when God has gifted you to serve in the body of Christ, that that service is all based on a love for each other. So that's something we all do. You know, I don't know what my kids are. Love each other. Because he says here that the unity, there's no division in the body. Why? Because we have this mutual care for each other. So that we want to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. But that's the relational aspect of the body of Christ functioning appropriately. And then in verse 27, he says, now you are Christ's body. And individually members of it. MacArthur says Christians are not assembly line productions. With every unit being exactly like every other unit. Consequently, no Christian can replace another in God's plan. He has his own individualized plan for each of us. And has individually gifted us accordingly. We are not interchangeable parts in Christ's body. God has designed us uniquely. To fit into his body. No excuses. No justifications. Now I'll use a personal illustration. Some of you have known me long enough. That you know who my first wife was. My first wife. Her name is Sue. And she's with Jesus. My first wife. Had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Onset at age 13. By the time she was 18, her hands were completely crippled. The day that she passed, went into the presence of the Lord. Every joint from her jaws to her toes had been destroyed. It was a devastating disease. But my wife loved the Lord, and she was faithful. She never questioned God's goodness, although in all the years I knew her, she, to my knowledge, never had a pain-free day. In the last years of her life, there was not enough medication to truly moderate the pain. And yet she faithfully served the Lord. Faithfully. And I stood by her side when God took her home. Best day of her life. A little rough for me. I'm remarried today to a gal who was single her whole life. And she joined me. And she's good friends with my wife, Sue. But Sue, if you looked at her, and Chris could testify to this, it was obvious her body did not work right. And she'd joke about it. I mean, she would, wouldn't she? Oh, my goodness. She'd take her thumb because it'd do 360s right here. There's no joint. You know? And you go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the truth is, when your thumb does that, you can't pick things up. Because when you try to pick things up, your thumb just moves. Nothing you can do about it. Lose the joints in your toes, try putting shoes on. Because if they don't go in right, you can't maneuver them. They won't move. It's devastating. It's an awful disease. Are you a Christian? You're part of the body of Christ. God didn't save you just so you could go to heaven. God saved you to make you a part of the body of Christ so that you would work alongside of your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. 
to accomplish the work of God for the glory of God until the day that God Almighty calls you home. This is not about you. It's not about your convenience. This is about you living in submission to the living God. And you think that, that it doesn't matter if you just decide not to do it? Ah, I wish you could see my wife. She was a lovely person, but her body was devastated. When the body doesn't function right, it's dysfunctional. And you oppose the building of Christ church. So it's not that you can be passive. I'll just not be engaged. No, no, no. To be passive is to oppose. To be passive is to oppose. God used the picture of the body of Christ very intentionally so we would understand how important it is for every believer to live in submission to Christ and joyfully, because this is not an obligation, a, a burden, to joyfully come alongside and love each other and serve each other and serve God and teach and encourage and do all the things that God's word instructs. We are the body of Christ we are the temple of God in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. And he's speaking of the church. In the ESV notes, it says the one who destroys God's temple in this context, the church, is not part of God's people and so faces eternal destruction on the final day. Just as God eventually destroyed the Babylonians who had destroyed Solomon's temple. We are this temple, holy temple. First Peter, we talked about that before too, same thing. We're called the household or the family of God. So you guys, probably a lot of us come from what we would call dysfunctional biological families. Okay? Not everybody here. But there's probably a few of you, right? That your family was like... Okay, not exactly a picture of God's love for people. But we are part of a different family. I mean, I have family members that I'm not close to. We, we believe things very differently. But I have family. I have genuine family that I love and they love me. And we're on this earth for one purpose, and that is to bring glory to God. In Ephesians 2.19, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints. You're of God's household. I mean, isn't that exciting? 2 Corinthians 6.18, I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I mean, you guys, what a family. What a family. We're family. That's why we're relational. That's why we care about each other and the struggles you're going through, the joys you're going through. We care because we're family. And we're able to love with a love we couldn't have, have loved with before we came to know Christ. But now we can love because he first loved us for the bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 and 2, I wish that you would bear with me a little in foolishness, but indeed you're bearing with me, for I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. You understand the intimacy of that picture that we have? Is the bride of Christ... We already talked about Ephesians 5 and Revelation 19, 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That is an intimate picture of the relationship that you and I have with the living God. And I think it's just remarkable. If you read the high priestly prayer in John 17, you guys, do you, do you realize that God loves you with the same love that he has for Christ? That is unfathomable to me. Because Christ was the perfect son of God. And that God would love me with the same love that he loves Christ? <sighs> I can't even comprehend it. Revelation 21.9, one of the seven angels with the seven bowls for the seven last plagues came and spoke to me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. 
The church is the pillar and support of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. You guys, that's why when you read scripture, it emphasizes the importance of knowing God more, knowing his word. We need to know truth. And I think so many churches are just passive about knowing truth. Because it's, it's work to learn and to remember so that we know it, so we can defend it. But you guys, the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. So, so the idea is that if somebody walks into this church and walks up to David and says, David, why do you guys believe the Trinity when the word's not even used in the Bible? David doesn't need to say, Go talk to Chris. David opens his Bible. He says, let me teach you why. You guys, that's the church. It's not one man answers the question. It's that the leaders teach, equip the saints to be able to answer the questions. And we all are willing to do the work to be able to do that. The church is the pillar and support of the truth. Church is called the flock of God in John 10, 16. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. I already referenced the Acts 20 passage when it says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. It's a flock of God. And 1 Peter 5, when it speaks of elders, it says, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. It says, Shepherd the flock of God among you. For your God's flock. Wayne Mack says, I believe that one major reason that the church of Jesus Christ in the United States is very close to being in sheer chaos today is because so many people think themselves as individuals rather than as part of the body of Christ. Christianity is not every man for himself. It is every man together for Christ. Every man together for Christ. It is essential that you understand that you cannot have Christianity without the church. True Christians cannot function independently from the church. Does the Bible ever speak of a churchless Christian? Based on your perspective of the church and your personal patterns of life, how would those who know you best describe your relationship with the church? So the people who know you best, whether it's uh, your wife, your kids, neighbors, coworkers, the people that know you best, if we ask them, how would you describe so-and-so's relationship to the church or perspective of the church? What would they say? Is the church a convenience, an obligation, a delight, an option, a priority, a love? How would people describe you? How would you describe yourself as far as your relationship with the church? Are you engaged and functioning as God intends in the body of Christ, the church? I don't think I could possibly emphasize enough how important the church is to God. I don't think I could. I want to walk you through some questions and I want to just let you know where we're going tomorrow in our lessons. So in this lesson, there's several questions. If you were talking to a professing Christian who does not go to church, who, did, or who does not consider church as a high priority, what would you say to them? I mean, do you guys hear that often? Like I do, when you talk to people and they say, ah, I'm a Christian, well, I don't go to church, you know, I don't go to church, you know, I serve somewhere and, you know, and I'm usually out on the weekends and da, 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 da. what would you say? Because I think the danger is, and, and really what I wrote to this man that came to my house for the propane tank, what I wrote to him was, you warned me about that stove being a danger. And I really appreciate the fact that you did that. And because of that, I dismantled that and got rid of it. I would like to share with you a danger that's even greater than that propane stove. 
And it's the danger of claiming to be a Christian and yet refusing to submit to the Lord and what he teaches. That's a far greater danger. To my knowledge, he's not come to church. But you know, I at least want him to know that the way you're living is inconsistent with what it means to be a Christian. Only God knows his heart. But it's inconsistent. And at the very least, he ought to be deeply concerned about whether he really has been converted. I want him to know that. So as you interact with people, you're going to talk to people. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't need to go to church. You know, I love the Lord. You can't love the Lord if you don't obey him. Why is it so important to understand that Christ is the head of the church? You guys, I'm just telling you, if you could just grasp that. So then we get past this, well, Chris this, or the elders this. Or the, no, no, it's Christ's church. Christ is the head of the church. What would Christ want me to do? How would Christ want me to respond? How can I best serve the body of Christ? I think it's interesting today that, okay, this might be a hot button. Are you okay with that? We're friends. I'm leaving. No. Ah. no, no, no. You know, the whole idea of church membership. Well, I don't have to become a church member. It's like, no, no, no. You have to do way more than that, actually. Way more. Okay, come on. You're going to fight over, well, I'm going to be or I'm not going to be a church member. You've got to be kidding me. This is way bigger than that. That's a simple thing to affirm the reality where you stand in the church and the doctrine of the church for the glory of God. That's a minor thing. What's required of you is way more than that. So if you're one of those guys, get over it. Okay. I'm just telling you guys, Christians get caught up about things. It's like, what is wrong? Why are you making a big deal? Are you not willing to be in submission to the leadership of the church? This is not a big deal. I'm telling you, the responsibility of Christians is way bigger than that. Sorry, Chris. We can talk later. I, but I just hear these things that people are fighting over these things and making a big deal out of them. And I'm saying, you don't get it. Being a part of the church is way more than that. It's way more than that. So let's not get petty. I mean, those are simple things. Anyways, why is the term the body of Christ so helpful in understanding the church? I think it's immensely helpful to think about what it means to be part of the body of Christ. And then what other descriptions of the church do you find most helpful? How can individualism harm the church? If you think that Christianity is all about you going to heaven, that's just another selfish pursuit. Okay? Christianity is about the fact that you're an enemy of God. You are an enemy of God. And apart from somebody being your substitute, you will deservedly go to hell. Okay? An enemy of God. And God, in order to reconcile you, sent his own son to live a perfect life, to pay a price for every sin you ever committed, so that he could treat you like you lived Christ's life. Being a Christian is not just so you can go to heaven. It's so that you can be reconciled to a holy God and become his child instead of his enemy. So that now you have a relationship with the creator of the universe and the rest of your life is your delight to strive to live for him. And it won't be perfect. It won't be pretty. Okay. I think I've shared this illustration with you before, but it helps me so much. Okay. So I have grandkids. Okay. And when they were little, mine are starting to get grown. When they're little, they draw a picture for grandpa and they bring it to me. And I look at the picture and you guys, what, do I look at it and go, what on earth is this? No, I don't do that. Look at it, I go, oh, that's really, uh, explain it. You know, oh, that's a picture of you, daddo. They call me daddo. And I go, and I don't go, green face? I don't think so. No, no, I don't do that. It's precious. You know, if it's one with lines, and they bring it up and they've colored it, and you guys, I mean, it's like there's no lines. 
So when I get it, I don't look at it and go, you know what the lines are for? <laughs> I don't do that. I put it in my office. I put it in the refrigerator. It is an absolute delight to me. You guys, as Christians, that picture is kind of like our lives. Right? Our lives. Sometimes not the right colors. Sometimes not in the lines. We struggle. But my grandchild gives that to me because they love me and I love them. In our striving, we struggle. And we'll struggle to the day we die. But we want to please him because we love him. So even though it's not in the lines, even though it's not always the right colors, God is pleased with our desire to love him and to serve him. He's pleased with that. Do we deserve that? No. But he's our father. And that's how much he loves us. And so I'm not talking perfection here. But I'm talking direction. That you want to please him. You want to honor him. You want to live for him. And then in what ways are you functioning in the body of Christ? And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. Okay, because I know some would say, but I don't know what, what's my gift or how do I fit and things like that. We're going to talk about that some tomorrow. And we're, in the morning, we're also going to talk about um, what God has done miraculously in each believer's life so that he equips you and provides all you need for you to serve well in the body of Christ. Because there's an amazing array of things that God has done miraculously in your life for that purpose, which I find very encouraging because you know how it is. If, if God doesn't do it in and through my life, we're all in trouble, right? But God has made incredible provision that I find immensely encouraging when we think about what he's done so that we can serve appropriately in the body of Christ. So I'm hopeful that that will be useful to you and encouraging to you. Y'all have been great. It's just a little after nine o'clock. It's a lot. Okay. But I appreciate you. Uh, if you're able to come in the morning, I look forward to uh, seeing you in the morning. So let me pray and then I'll turn it back to David. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I mean, I would admit, and I suspect most, maybe all of us would, that, that while you give us so much truth so that we can understand these things, that we often don't grasp them, at least not at the level that you ultimately would want. And I, I just pray that you'd help each of us to, to really wrestle with these things. And again, not, not that it would be a, just an unhealthy burden, but that it would just remind us of what you've done and who you are and what the church is about. Lord, that our priorities would reflect your priorities and that you would be pleased with us individually and then as a church corporately. Lord, that we would be able to serve you well. And even as this church has been an incredible light in this community, and I'm so excited, not only for the church plant from years ago with Greg, but with, with Craig. And I know they're going to uh, now launch officially, I think, this Sunday, at least in their soft opening. And Lord, might that be a huge blessing in this area. And, and uh, I'm just grateful for what you've done. And I just pray that it would continue that this church, by your grace, would bear much fruit for your glory. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so...